Well, good morning. Welcome to Grace Bible Church and our equipping hour. This is the second part of the wonders of his love. And let's uh, open in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather again this week, this morning. And Lord, even thinking about what we get to enjoy as a body and hearing the testimonies of your grace and your love and the lives of your people and reflecting on the benefit of the local church and what you have done to reconcile us to yourself, but also to reconcile us to one another. Lord, we're so grateful. Lord, that we have your word, that we can know about you, that we can know truths pertaining to you, that we can understand and comprehend and have insight into your character into your virtue, into your love is astonishing. It's astounding. And Lord, I pray that this morning our hearts would be captivated by you. Lord, as we dive deep into your greatness expressed in your love, Lord, I pray that our faith would be deepened, that our love, Lord, would be strengthened, that our zeal would be intensified that we would be more faithful, more useful vessels to our Creator as we seek to live lives of worship of you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, last week we looked at the love of God. We're going to take another look at the love of God this morning, particularly in his work through Christ in the gospel. And last week, we talked about the love of God, and we defined the love of God this way, that God gives of himself to others for their good by his own choice, regardless of their merit or response. That the love of God could be summed up this way if you were to attempt to do such an act of summing up the love of God in a statement, which is impossible to do, but to, to try to best encapsulate what the love of God is, it's that God gives of himself to others for their good by his own choice, regardless of their merit or response. And by way of review, we looked at four elements of God's wondrous love that we see throughout Scripture, and we saw, number one, that God's love is unprompted. We looked at Deuteronomy 7, we saw that God's love is unprompted, it's everlasting, it's undeserved, it doesn't originate out of what others are or what others can do for God. He has loved from everlasting. His love originates, it is compelled, it is prompted only out of himself. It is free, unprovoked, spontaneous. We saw that in Deuteronomy 7, 7, where it says, The Lord did not set his love on you, pertaining to the nation of Israel, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any of the other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. We looked at how God's love is not a testimony to the value of the object of his love, but is a testimony to the purity, holiness, and nature of his love. And we'll look again at this reality this morning as we dive into the love of God in the gospel. We also saw that God's love is indiscriminate, and we saw that in the story of Jonah. God's love is indiscriminate. He shows compassion on whom he desires. He gets to choose. His love does not subject itself to our reasoning. He is worthy of our praise. He's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our submission even when we don't understand, even when it doesn't make sense, like it didn't make sense to Jonah. We also saw that God's love is inseparable. That is, it's, it's permanent. It cannot be undone. It cannot be thwarted. And we looked at Romans 8, 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ. And 37, in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. And in verse 38 of Romans 8, Paul says, I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We can have an unwavering confidence in the love of God. There is security. There is hope. 
for the believer. You cannot be separated from God's love. There is no limit, no separation. You are secure. You are bound to God in love. It cannot be undone. And then we saw that God's love is incomprehensible. We will never be able to fully dive into the depths of all that God's love is. In Ephesians, Paul says that his desire, he prays that we would be able to comprehend believers with all the saints, what is the breadth and length and height and depth to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. Paul wants them to grasp and understand something that is beyond comprehension. Trying to take in the beauty of something whose beauty never ends. God's love is truly wondrous. It's truly amazing. It's truly captivating. And for those who have experienced such a love, there is nothing we could say to adequately express gratefulness for the love that God has lavished upon us. Well, this morning, we're going to look at the clearest demonstration of God's love. And it's found in the person of Jesus. And what God has done in the gospel through his son is the most vivid demonstration and expression of his love. If you want to dive into the wonders of the love of God, we must simply look to the cross. And that's what we're going to do this morning. In the gospel, we see the expression of God's love so beautifully put on display. And so let's do that together. Let's look at the love of God in Christ. We're going to look at Romans 5 primarily this morning. Romans chapter 5. I'm going to read verses 1 through 11, but we're primarily going to spend our time this morning in verses 6 through 11. Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exalt in hope of the glory of God. Of God. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Well, this morning we're going to look at four realities of God's wondrous love demonstrated in Christ. We're going to look at four realities of God's wondrous love demonstrated in Christ. What we're going to look at first is that the love of God demonstrated in Christ demonstrates God's love is, number one, unmerited. The love God demonstrates in Christ demonstrates God's love is unmerited. Unmerited. That's number one. Look at verse six again. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jump down to verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. 
The love of God demonstrated in Christ demonstrates God's love is unmerited. We don't deserve it. God's love is undeserved, unmerited, unwarranted. We deserved wrath. We deserved condemnation. Nothing was appealing in or about us. Then Paul says in verse 6, at the right time. At the very time when you were this, this, and this, at that condition, while you were in an egregious condition, God demonstrated his love. And he gives four descriptions. Uh, Paul is setting God's love against the condition of those on whom he sets his love. There's a contrast here. When you were all these things which didn't deserve love, God demonstrated his love. We see four descriptions. The first one is, while we were still helpless. Do you see that in verse 6? For while we were still helpless. Helpless. This word is the word used oftentimes for weakness. It can be physical weakness or spiritual weakness. And here, obviously, it's being referred to spiritual weakness. We were morally incapable of changing our standing before God. That is what Paul is getting at here. While we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died. Prior to Christ's sacrifice, we were morally helpless. We were incapable. We were unable. We lacked the ability of doing anything good that would change our standing before God. We were incapable of doing anything good of increasing our value before him. Each one of us is completely weak apart from Christ. In our weakness to be, to be helpless in this way, we would have a better chance of, of asking a cow to fly. A cow lacks everything that is needed to fly, and so we were helpless. We lacked everything we needed to be right before God, to be reconciled to God. We were helpless. Nothing in ourselves would lend us to being able to do anything about our condition. We were completely helpless. Second, Paul says Christ died for the ungodly. We were ungodly. Uh, There was godlessness in us. We were outside of God. In our thoughts, we were ungodly in our deeds, in our speech, in our moral character. Whatever a a proper relationship to God should look like, we violated that continually and completely. We were full of pride and self-will, self-exaltation, self-serving, self-seeking, self-grasping. We were created for God, to glorify God, to worship God. And in contrast to that, we were completely void of anything pertaining to a right view of God and a submission to God and a worship of God. Ungodliness, helplessness. Paul also says in verse 8 that we were yet sinners. Look at verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. To be a sinner is to be unholy, guilty, defiled. Sin is to, to miss the mark of God's standard or expectation. And it's not that we were just slightly off of center on the target We were aiming in a different direction. Even in Romans 1, we see the human disposition towards God as one that seeks to suppress truth about God and unrighteousness, rebellion against him. The fourth descriptor we see in verse 10, for if while we were enemies, we were enemies, we were hostile to God, We were a stench to God, a defiling presence to him. We traded his glory for images made in the form of corruptible man and of animals. And any thought that we were not that bad is just egregious. We, the finite creation, elevated ourselves to the position of God. The absolute heinous arrogance and pride that is demonstrated in each one of us to rebel against our maker 
to exalt ourselves when we should only seek to exalt him. What is God's righteous response to the sinner? To me, prior to Christ's work, his holiness recoils from me. We were enemies of him. His character must judge me. We deserve judgment, wrath, punishment, condemnation, eternal torment. And at that time, when each one of us were all of those things, God demonstrated his love. What kind of love is this? What kind of love is this? God's love is completely unmerited. It's unprompted. Prior to the work of Christ, everything about us, everything about us deserved wrath, and nothing in us deserved love. And God demonstrated his love. God's love is unprompted, it's unmerited, it's undeserved. The love of God demonstrated in Christ demonstrates God's love is unmerited. And next, number two, the love of God demonstrated in Christ demonstrates God's love, love is unique. And I hope you're already starting to see that. God's love is wholly unique. And this expression of God loving us at this condition, at, at this time, demonstrates that God is unique, but that his love is unique. But in verse 7 and 8, we're going to see this expressed very vividly, how exclusive, how unique, how extraordinary God's love truly is. <clears throat> Excuse me. So number two, one more time, hold on. Yeah, I think I'm good. We'll see. God's number one, his love is unmerited. Number two, it is unique. Look at verses seven and eight. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare even to die. Verse eight, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God's love is completely unique from any other love we could find. God's love is a stark contrast to human love. God's love goes way, way, way beyond the farthest human love would ever go. Verse 7 is a description of human love. In verse 7, Paul sets forth what human love might look like at its most extreme. Look at verse 7. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. H human love is based on the object's value. And that's the point that Paul's making here. Someone will hardly die for a righteous man. If you can find a righteous man or a good man, uh, someone will hardly die for that man. You might be able to find someone who would, who would die for a righteous man, for a good man. God's love is in contrast to this. And as we ponder human love for, mo for just a moment, uh, imagine someone is the best of humanity. They're righteous, they're good. Every, every standard that we can look at among us, some, someone exceeds that. And, and yet, let's say they are deathly ill. They need a heart transplant. Who would like to volunteer their own life for that one? Uh, the thought of giving up a healthy person's heart to exchange their life for another would hardly cross one's mind. We might have someone who's terminal give up a crucial organ for somebody else. But for a healthy person to exchange their life for another would, would hardly cross one's mind. Our, our response might be, well, we will pray for you, brother. <laughs> we'll pray for God's provision. But no healthy person goes, typically, sign me up for that. 
You might find something like this in a heroic act on, act on the battlefield of someone giving their life for a fellow soldier, but human love is, is prompted by the worth of the one receiving the love. Is, is this one worthy? Does the circumstance call for it? Does it allow for it? And in just the right case, just the right person might be found worthy of such a sacrifice. One will hardly die for a righteous man, yet for the good man, someone would even dare even to die. Only someone who is worthy of such a sacrifice might be found good enough for someone to give their life for. God's love is in contrast to this. God's love is contrast to this. God's love is based on the giver's nature. Human love says, if you're worthy, and if it's worth it to me based on my assessment of you, I might be willing to give it all for you. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in this, that, that God's love is sourced out of himself. He freely gives of himself regardless of our condition, not based on our condition. We were in this offensive condition. At that time, God demonstrated his love. We hated him and rejected him, and he sent Christ. He sent his only begotten, his unique son, to die for us. Once again, we see scripture just squash that view, squash that idea that we somehow deserved it, merited it, were worthy of such a love. Here, the expression of God's love clearly demonstrated <clears throat> is put on dis display in spite of who we were, which intensifies the majesty of God's love. When we think God sent his son in love to die because of something of value in us, it denigrates his sacrifice and love. It, it devalues it. It humanizes it. What makes God's love so wondrous is that we weren't valuable. We didn't elicit it. There wasn't anything worthy in us. We hated him. We were enemies of him. We were godless. Rebellious. We were created to worship and glorify him and everything we did, everything we did prior to Christ was self-oriented, God-hating. It was self-worship, self-exulting, and at that time he died for you, Christian. Divine love is based on the giver's nature. And we know something about the love of God in Christ. The love of God is different than human love. Human love is finite compared to divine love. Human love is far inferior. God's love is unrivaled. It is unique. It is exclusive. God is the only one that loves this way. And yet there's hope for the believer. As we experience this love, we can imitate him as well in it. What a gift. What a gift. The love of God demonstrated in Christ demonstrates God's love is number one, unmerited. Number two, it is unique. And number three, it is sacrificial. 
Thanks, Eric. Okay, now I'm good to go another three hours. All right. Number three, sacrificial. The love of God demonstrated in Christ demonstrates God's love is number three, sacrificial. It is sacrificial. Uh, The God-man endured the earthly pains and humiliation of death, the physical pain of death, and endured death itself. Look at our passage again, verse 6. For while we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Verse 9, much more than now having been justified by his blood. Verse 10, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. God's love demonstrated in Christ is a sacrificial love. It is a self-giving love. The God-man endured the earthly pains, the humiliation of death, the physical pains of death, death itself in the physical sense. But more than that, he endured the rejection of his father while he was innocent and holy and sinless. If you want to see how much better divine love is compared to human love, know the circumstances of those on whom he set his love and know the lengths he went to to reconcile them to himself. God's love is costly. It costs him something more precious than we could ever comprehend. God the Father sacrificed God the Son. God crushed his son, and it pleased him to do so. This unmerited, this unique love, this is a sacrificial love. This is a self-giving love. As we consider the sacrifice of Christ, just think for a moment on 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus was the sinless son. He was made the perfect sacrifice, the perfect substitute, and the sinless son went to the cross. And he, the father, made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf And this does not mean that Jesus became a sinner or that Jesus was punished for any sin of his own. Rather, the Father transferred all of the sins to Jesus Christ upon the cross, and he bore the weight, and he bore the shame, and he bore the guilt, and the pollution of all of the sins for every Christian who would believe for all time. Jesus, he himself was completely pure. He was completely holy, and yet he became guilty. As sins that were not his own were placed upon him. And God did not merely write off our debt. God did not just act as if our sins never occurred. God did not sweep our sins under the rug. God did not violate any other attribute that he possesses in his expression of love. He fulfilled every attribute perfectly and beautifully and upheld his justice and his righteousness and his indignation against sin. His holiness, his justice, he did not merely just look the other way. God acted, and he did so in a self-giving manner to the ultimate extent as he gave his son. God dealt with the sins of all who would believe. God transferred these sins of all who would believe to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he made him to become sin on our behalf. At the cross... Christian, our dirty rags of self-righteousness were taken off of us and Christ was clothed with the rags of our iniquities and the wages of our sin, Christian, were, were backed out of our account and they were placed into Christ's account who had never had one sin charged against him. 
At the cross, Jesus bore our condemnation so that those who are in Christ are no longer condemned. He bore our sin and became guilty under the law before God, and only Jesus could do this. Either our sins were going to be on us, or they were placed on Jesus. And in the moment when Jesus was upon the cross, believer, all of your sins were transferred to Jesus. All of our sins taken off of us and placed on Christ. All of our unbelief, all of our selfishness, all of our rebellion, all of our disobedience, all of our wrongdoings, all of our evil thoughts, all of our impure ambitions, all of our self-centered motives, all of our idolatry, all of our violence, all of our dishonoring of parents, and all of our stealing and lying and hating and lusting and coveting, all of this and more was transferred onto Christ. And as Christ became sin for us, Christ suffered all of the consequences of sin for us. He suffered under the wrath of God for us. He suffered separation from God. He suffered shame before God for our sins. He suffered death from God. He suffered judgment and torment oppression and rejection from God for us. He suffered condemnation. He suffered the fury of the righteous anger of God for our sins. The cross was a torture chamber in which our Lord Jesus Christ suffered in agony for our sins. Our sins were imputed to him or transferred to him on the cross that we would never see them ever again in the final judgment. Now, we are reconciled. We are forgiven. We are made slaves of God. We are adopted as children of God. God will never again punish these same sins as Jesus has paid the debt in full. Jesus indeed was the perfect substitute, the only acceptable sacrifice. And in love, God placed our sins upon Jesus. And in turn, God placed Christ's righteousness upon us? Helpless? Godless? Sinners? Enemies? We are counted righteous in Christ, substitutionary atonement. Christ atoned. He he paid for the sins of every person who would believe upon him. He died in our place. He took the wrath of God. And, And through Jesus' sinless life and substitutionary death, he offers the perfect righteousness that he possesses to those who believe upon him. My sin is taken off of me. It is placed and given to Christ. And Christ bore them at the cross. And his perfect garments of holiness and righteousness given to me? My debt of sin, my spiritual bankruptcy before God transferred out of my account. And at the cross, he became sin. And I get the riches of his righteousness. And now for those who are in Christ, for those who have been reconciled by this work of Christ, all the treasures and riches of his forgiveness and reconciliation and mercy from God, we possess these things. My condemnation before the judge of heaven and earth and the wrath of God upon me transferred to Christ. He became condemned before God because he became sin for me as he bore my sin. If you're in Christ, this is true for you. What a gift. What a love. There's nothing we can do to earn it. Nothing we did to deserve it. 
It is holy and exclusively a free gift given by his grace. And as such, it puts forth the glory and the riches of his forgiveness and demonstrates the wonders of his amazing love. His love is sacrificial. What more could he give? What more could he do? The love of God demonstrated in Christ demonstrates God's love is unmerited, unique, sacrificial, and lastly, it's effective. It is effective. The love God demonstrates in Christ demonstrates God's love is effective. Look at verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. This is a done deal. He did this. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. God's love expressed in sending his son is effective. It accomplished God's intended purposes. God's love demonstrated in Christ has reconciled us to God. And because Jesus is risen, because he is alive, alive now, we have hope in this reconciling work of God to keep us. There is no future wrath for us. There is nothing we can do to undo what he has done. Christ took the wrath of God and, and rose from the grave. He conquered death. And now having been justified by his blood, do you really think that you could undo his love? And we looked at that last week, that his love is, is inseparable. We can't separate ourselves from this love. We can't undo ourselves from this love. His love poured out on you. It wasn't dependent upon you to start with. And a failure after coming to Christ cannot rob you of his love. There isn't anything about you that could, could secretly sneak up in God and catch him off guard. That he would go, oh, I wish I hadn't died for that person. Have you ever given something to someone thinking they were going to use it for a specific purpose and then you find out it wasn't quite what you thought and, and you regretted it? Ah, I wish I hadn't given that $20 to the person at the gas station. I wish I had just bought them dinner. That never happens with God. God never lavishes his love upon an individual and then watches what somebody does with it and goes, ah, I'm going to take it back. It's not how God operates it at all. His, his love, remember, is unique. It's not dependent on us to start with. We can't undo what God has done. For one who is a genuine believer in Christ, God will keep that person. You were in the worst possible state prior to salvation, and at that time he died for you. He, he knew who you were. There's not one bit of failure that surprises him. If you're a genuine believer, you will not come under the wrath of God. The work of Christ cannot be thwarted. It cannot be stopped. It cannot be changed by some failure on your part. God's love is higher. It is so much more profound. And when we see his love at the cross, you should never doubt that you could damage that love by failing him. What a wonderful truth. This truth should embolden the believer to faithfulness before God. This truth of God's unrelenting, unfailing love should embolden the believer to their, his or her relentless pursuit of godliness. What it should not do is make the believer complacent in regards to their sin. Because one who has had this kind of love demonstrated to them can do nothing but respond to God in love. And so though we may fail, we cannot separate ourselves from God's love, but the believer is never complacent to perpetually pursue failing. That's not who we are in Christ. 
And so this reality of God's effective work, it actually leads to worship. It leads to faithfulness despite our failures. It doesn't ever make the believer, it shouldn't ever make the believer complacent in regards to their failures. Bask in the assurance of the hope that is found in the love of God. Don't live in fear that you can undo God's love. No discovery can dis disillusion him about us. At the foot of the cross, we see an act of love so, so, so great. Why is it so great? Because our offense to a holy God was so great, and Christ's innocence was so pure, holy. Still, he came to earth. He fixed his love on us. Our concept of love is typically so self-oriented, and yet God's expression of love is so self-giving. As we wrap up this morning, two, two responses to this wondrous love of God. How must we respond to this great love of God demonstrated in Christ? Number one, exult. Exult in God. That is worship. Even in this passage, the proper response to these things is to exult. Look, at, look again, starting in verse 4. Therefore, having been justified by faith, and that's really what Paul is, is launching into this discourse from, the justifying work of God by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And look at verse 2, this, the, the last phrase there. And we exalt in the hope of glory of God. And then look at verse 3. And not only this, but we also exalt in tribulation. Jump down to verse 11. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This passage is about worship. Because of the justifying work of God through his son Jesus. That's the only right response to what God has done in justifying the believer. And his justifying the believer demonstrates his love for Christians. Normal response to the Christian life is to worship God. That's what every believer is called to do. That's what every human is called to do. The believer is the one who does it. And here Paul says, exult in the assurance of glory in verse 2. Glory is coming. We know it is secured for us. We don't rejoice primarily in what we have in this world, but what we get to do here is for the purposes of magnified glory in eternity. And we boast in our afflictions in our tribulations, look at verse 3. And not only this, but we also exalt in tribulations. We, we worship God in our tribulations. We exalt, we glorify God, we, we magnify God. How does this happen? How does a human who suffers brag about the benefits of suffering? Trouble is difficult. Affliction is real. Hardships are intense. And yet God uses these things. We exalt in tribulations knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance proven character and proven character hope and hope does not disappoint. The hope for the believer is unique from how the world thinks about hope. The world thinks about hope, I hope this happens as if it's a, a possibility. But for the believer, the hope that we have in Christ is a certainty, a confident expectation, a reality yet to be revealed that we will, we will enjoy and benefit from. And so in verse 2, we, we worship, we exult, we glorify God in the hope of the glory of God. We also exult, we worship in our tribulations because all of these things, these hardships, these difficulties, these trials, they only enhance our hope. You might be tempted to think, is this affliction really necessary? Do I really have to go through this to enhance my spiritual growth? 
God's answer is yes. Joy in the midst of trials is waiting for us. How do we experience joy when the pain is great, when the hardship is real, when the difficulty is intense? Wouldn't it make more sense to remove my afflictions so that I wouldn't fail so much in my disbelief? The answer is no. We boast about weaknesses in order to show off Christ. And that is much, much better. And then we exult in the fact that we have been reconciled to God through the death of his son. And now we experience a a security and eternity with God whom we get to serve now. That same love that gives us such a bold confidence that we cannot undo God's love in our sin gives us an unrelenting drive to live faithfully for him now in obedience. What could provide a deeper joy, a more profound reality, a stronger security, a greater power than knowing the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord? When we ponder the love of God demonstrated in Christ, how, how could we ever question God's love? Many of you know the the trial my family went through about 14 months ago now, and our youngest son, Caleb, passed away unexpectedly at five years old. And the days and weeks to follow, the love of this body shown to us was overwhelming. Countless expressions of sacrificial love given to us from acts of service to cards to encouragements, to gifts. It was just overwhelming. And I remember talking with Julie and we were having a conversation. We just said, you know what? If we are ever tempted to think that we're not loved by this church, it it is just utter insanity. (laughs) There, There is just no reasonable way for us to come to any sort of conclusion or entertain the thought that this church body does not love us. Have you ever doubted God's love for you? What would ever lead us to doubt God's love for us in light of what he has done through his son? As wonderful and intense of a love as you all have shown and continue to show to us, far deeper, far greater still, the love of God for every single one of his children. It is a wondrous love. Lastly, what's a proper response to this? Turn to Ephesians 5. We'll close with this. As we ponder the wonders of God's love in Christ, I want you to look at verses 1 and 2 with me of Ephesians chapter 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us an offering, and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Let us imitate God in our love for one another. Let us walk in love. Let us walk in a willingness to give of ourselves for others' benefit without any prompting or expectation in return. How many times have you Loved, thought you were loving somebody, sacrificed, gave of yourself, only to find yourself disappointed or hurt in return. And maybe you were tempted to recoil and go, you know, I I don't want to do that again. It's not what God calls us to. We are called to love, to walk in love, 
to imitate Christ, to demonstrate faithful, self-giving care for one another without placing demands on how that needs to be reciprocated or returned. We simply give. Is it enough to love others because it glorifies God to imitate God, or do you expect something in return? If you imitate God in this way, if you walk in holiness of life, if you walk in obedience to the word, if you give of yourself in love for others, you will lack no good thing. The Lord is faithful. The Lord loves to exalt those who humble themselves. We see that to the fullest degree in Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time this morning to ponder the depths of your love demonstrated in Christ. Lord, your love truly is wondrous. And Lord, I pray that even this Lord's Day, as we continue to worship you and fellowship with one another, that this time would be uh, proven as well spent as we demonstrate to one another the love that we have received from you. Lord, I pray that we would honor you this day and, and every day, especially as Christmas approaches and thinking rightly about the sacrifice, about thinking rightly about the incarnation of Jesus taking on flesh, but being born for a purpose, being born to die, that we might be reconciled to you, that we might be justified before you. And Lord, we know that that screams forth what is true about your glorious nature. And so, Lord, protect us from making your love about ourselves. Protect us from diminishing your love or humanizing your love and our pride or our arrogance. But help us just to yield. Help us to submit to what Scripture has said. What you have declared is true about you. What you have demonstrated to the fullest degree in the giving of your Son for all who would believe upon you. Lord, help us to worship you well. Help us to imitate you faithfully. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.